So after half a century in which the, sta the slavery and its aftermath was the central focus of American political life, by around 1900, white America at least, native-born white America, had reached a consensus. That is, slavery was gone, nobody was think talking about bringing it back, but the freedom of African Americans was very limited, let's just put it that way. And to return to the theme that I started with in January, historians provided some of the intellectual justification for this new national uh, uh, consensus. Ulrich B. Phillips's dominant view of slavery as a time of paternalism and you know, happy slaves and a kind of a community of interest between master and slave, the Dunning School here at Columbia, their view of Reconstruction giving legitimacy to the disenfranchisement of black voters. Um, President Woodrow Wilson over and over talked about the failure of Reconstruction. Blacks were excited, he wrote, by a freedom they did not understand, unpractised in liberty, they had to be removed from the body politic. As I've said before, Reconstruction historical writing is more directly political and more implicitly moral in a way than writing on almost any other subject in American history. Ultimately, what people are writing about when they write about Reconstruction is what kind of country they think the United States uh, ought to be. So from 1900, it would take another half century until another generation rediscovered the agenda of Reconstruction and took to the streets to revive these sleeping giants uh, in the Constitution. One of the interesting things about the Civil Rights era is there were no constitutional changes except for a minor amendment about the poll tax. We did not need a new Constitution. We needed the old Constitution to actually be enforced. And once the federal government was forced to enforce the Constitution, the edifice of Jim Crow crumbled um, and gave us the world we are living in uh, today. So at the, end, uh, at the end of the Civil War, what, what's the lesson of all this? At the end of the Civil War, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, the commander of a famous unit of black soldiers in the war, wrote, revolutions may go backward. Revolutions may go backward. And that is what happened to the Second American Revolution, at least as far as African Americans were concerned. The other lesson, of course, is that which is relevant right now, not just back then, rights in the Constitution are not self-enforcing. It is not enough to have them on paper. One has to, every generation must be vigilant about breathing life into the rights we have because they are always, in one way or another, uh, in danger. But I want to finish up by showing you one further image, and this is, oddly enough, not from um, the United States, but from France. This is, um, this is the only course that ends with an image from France. It's a terrible picture because I took it with my Blackberry a couple of years ago. Um, <laughs> Let's see, but I'll tell you what it is. You can barely see it, but I'll describe it. This is in Luxembourg Gardens. If you happen to be over there this summer, having some nice aperitif on the Champs Elysees, walk over to Luxembourg Gardens. This is the monument to the victims of slavery. It's a broken chain, basically. You can, it's just a, it has two pieces to try to represent a broken chain, okay? It was um, unveiled a couple of years ago by President Sarkozy, in Luxembourg Gardens. We do not have a monument to the victims of slavery in this country. This is not all that imposing. It's out of the way. It's hard to find. But what interests me about it actually is the, um, is the uh, inscription, which says in French, this is a rough translation, by their struggles and their strong desire for, di for dignity and liberty, the slaves of the French colonies contributed to the universality of human rights and the ideal of liberty, equality, and fraternity that is the foundation of our republic. 
this is not a bad way to remember our history also. In other words, the monument posits not simply that France conferred freedom on the slaves, but says that France learned about freedom in part from them. In other words, to transpose that to the United States, we did not free the slaves, as I often hear when I talk about this. Well, after all, slavery is terrible, but we freed the slaves. Or to put it, the slaves are part of the we that created the modern uh, United States. So this is uh, basically the end of this discussion of this crucial era in American history. But one last little point, how should we think about history and in, any, in any case? Karl Marx said once, this may or may not be a good translation, history weighs like a nightmare on the brain of the present. And if you look around the world, you can see how that happens. People in some places are fighting over historical grievances that go back centuries. Um, in other words, we should remember history but not be obsessed or controlled by it. But history can also be uh, an inspiration, not just a nightmare. Uh, if we remember the long arc um, of, the, of this course and where we began in 1850, the abolition of slavery was a gigantic accomplishment and uh, I think it's possible to be inspired by the people who led the fight against it and who, even though they failed, tried after the Civil War to make the United States live up to the ideals of liberty and equality that, is, that are embedded in our uh, founding documents. So as I've tried to show, the legacy of slavery and the Civil War are still part of our society today in inequalities that still exist, and in the profound differences between the political culture of the old slave states and the rest of the country. Uh, ju again, just today in the New York Times is an article about the death penalty, which makes the point that in the past 30 years or so, something like 80% of the executions in this country have taken place in states that once had slavery. Is that just a coincidence? Or is it the dead weight of the past somehow still weighing on the present. But the struggle against slavery is also part of this historical legacy. In many ways, we live in a world whose contours were first glimpsed by the abolitionists, by the radical Republicans, by the freed people themselves in Reconstruction. In other words, a society which at least in law is one of equality, of no discrimination, of equal citizenship, for everybody. But in other ways, of course, that the task is still, that they laid out, is still unfinished. So this history, 150 years ago, is part of our world today, which is why understanding it is necessary if we want to make this a better and a more just and a more equal society. So with that, I just thank you and wish you luck on your finals. And <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all. Okay, that is, that is enough. I, I am very... Uh, Okay, folks, thank you all very much. I, I really do appreciate that, and um, good luck on the final. And uh, contrary to po some popular opinion on my own, this is the last time I'm teaching this course. <laughs> I still will be around somewhat the next couple of years, so perhaps I will see you in some other course if you wish. But anyway, thank you, and enjoy the summer and everything else. Good luck.